Okay. <laughs> Here, I'll pull that back up. Okay, thank you. Let me know what today's date is. March 30th. Tuesday, March 30th. So are you ready? Ready. All right. Ready. So our Empathy Surplus Congress is a community of practice. practice. Every, Every day, day we, we promote the idea of stronger people, people progressive markets, 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 better futures, future, effective government, government of our people, 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 and mutual responsibility, responsibility for practicing poor and empathic activities. We inwardly we digest, digest and use the latest brain insights of Dr. George Lakoff to frame daily caring conversations to promote human rights. Invest in weekly, weekly congressional, congressional hearings about how we apply Dr. Lakoff's insights to advance caring policy directions. We implement, implement caring, caring policy directions through partnerships with ethical businesses, effective government task force, and other caring society organizations. We invite others to join us and promote the politics of care. How is everyone? We all doing I'm good. Great. Good. Like I'm doing great. Gorgeous day outside for us. Did y'all see the? Uh, did y'all visit the recording that I put on put on YouTube last no. last week? No. So no. Uh, I haven't had a chance to. No, not yet. So it it's up there in case you want to refer to it. Okay. So I uh, my week this week uh, I had. Uh, a conversation with uh, Dr. Uh, Vicki Casanova Willis, who is the uh, co executive director of the uh, US Human Rights Network, and uh, was, uh, and in our organization, the Empathy Surplus Project Foundation, is uh, a part of a part of that group. And um, uh, they have a they have new leadership, but uh, we had a great conversation. And um, uh, I was telling her about the human rights pocketbook and, and uh, that sounded interesting to her. And, and um, uh, she's, I forget how it came up, but I mentioned it was modeled after um, uh, the dictionary project that uh, you know, Rotar Rotarians love so much. And she said, uh, oh yeah, I was a third grade, teacher and they brought her brought the dictionaries by that's a great idea <laughs> for first person who uh, you know or at least uh first person in a long time who knew what uh, knew what i was talking about that's, oh that's nice yeah and um uh, and one other thing was uh the uh upr is just finished the universal oh. periodic review yeah and, and um and of course, the United States is re-engaging. They're they're uh, rejoining the uh, the uh, Human Rights Council, et cetera. And um, so uh, I uh, I've offered some input on a, a, a letter of um, a letter of gratitude, I guess, from the uh, USHRN uh, to uh, President Biden on rejoining the. Uh, Human Rights Council, and, oh, okay. uh, and uh, it, it hasn't been sent yet, um, and I, uh, uh, but if you're interested, I can share, share what I, in fact, I copied Anita right. and Miriam, good, uh, good, so you can, good. if you want to see that, so anyway. Good, so did, uh, did we submit anything? Did we submit a statement to the periodic review this time? Uh, uh, we we did not. We didn't. We did not. Yeah. We're uh, you know w one of the things that uh, uh, is um, has kept us from being as involved as we'd like is is uh, they they have a weekly um, task. Uh, UPR task force yeah. that, that gathers on, uh, on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Oh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> well, I, I printed out the UPR basics 
pre-sessions training for CSOs and NHRIs. And I can never remember what an NHRI is, <laughs> but, but um, I've been, you know, trying to, you know, incorporate this into my repertoire. So. <laughs> Why don't you continue what you did last week, Anita? Oh, uh, well, so. You were pretty busy. I got stuff from you last week. Yeah. Right. So um, I have <laughs> I've people reaching out to me from uh, Guyana looking for mm -hmm. help, like the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance. And, and um, then I have this client in California who's reaching out to me to try to get his products. <laughs> so I'm trying to bring it all together under human rights bringing it all together you know under human rights and so i decided to take my little business i am clean energy which has never made a penny and turn it into a nonprofit, and um, to try to be a conduit from the united states down it opening into guyana which is like the front door to south america because it's the only english-speaking country down there well where english is the you know Primary language. Primary language, right, right, right. And uh, Anna and I love it so much. So um, did that. And then I was listening to a radio um, broadcast from Yellow Springs on um, yesterday morning, I guess it was. And um, so talking about uh, bringing uh, solar energy into Green County. So I called Yellow Springs Solar and invited that man to come over and he came right over. And so I'm trying to partner with him so that we can have a um, demonstration farm for clean energy here. And he seems pretty open to that. And so once people come to look at stuff, you know, then we talk about the human right to clean water, energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing, so. How about you, Ann? I have been putting along all around Virginia Beach looking for trees to cut. <laughs> <laughs> to cut. <laughs> yeah, so I've been taking um, a lot of our trees are in bloom down here. So it's actually easier to identify the, what oh. trees are, are oh. which. And um, so everything that's in bloom down here, I've taken probably um, half of a large bin full. Uh, you know, one of those 119 quart Sterilite bins. And I fill about half of it full of these um, small branch, not, not large branches, but um, probably about this size or, or smaller. And they have the flowers on it and it's really pretty. And so what I'm looking for is the green um, tree wood. And so this week I will be doing more dye, dyeing yarn experiments to see if these um, specific trees give off specific colors. And I was at my mother-in-law's house yesterday and chopping up her forsythia bush, so <laughs> trying to battle the bees. <laughs> so, no, it, was, it was fun. And um, I was able to go to Elizabeth City in North Carolina again to visit with a lady that I'm working with and it's been it's been pretty good uh, a little slow for me but it's been pretty good i've been studying real real hard so i have a my third test out of my accounting class coming up it's uh, a little daunting <laughs> so <laughs> wish me luck because i'll definitely need it so really greg how was your it, week it was it was good it was just busy just busy yeah. at work dealing with all the hr issues that i have to deal with Sure. people you know sure. <laughs> trying to make sure that people are doing their their goals and setting their goals and helping them work on their leadership competencies and you know stuff like that sure. so, oh, that's nice yeah. nice <laughs> about you Aaron so what have I been up to for a week yeah so a couple things um I'm going to farm sit in, in a, about a week for a couple months. And I've been meeting with the owners. They, um, they work in Australia. 
part of the year. So um, I'm just trying to learn what I need to do and where everything is and how to take care of it. So been really busy with that. Inter what is interesting, what is farm sitting. Farm sitting. Oh, okay, 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 cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice. nice. So do they, ha they have animals that you have to take care of? Is no, no, it's just basically land. Um, it, it's a seventh generation farm and it, it just needs somebody to keep an eye on it. Oh, wow. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, do you want to start with the reading? I don't know. If, has everybody read? Mm -hmm. I have. I was just rereading to make sure I'm. Um, We're on 6.6, .6, right? That's correct. Values to be mindful of. Right. Um, I have, um, I'm aware that we're recording and we could read or uh, I uh, have put um, this particular section in a Google Doc and uh, I could actually put that link in the, you know. Oh, when so I, people when can I read put it, it all? Yeah, if, you know, unless if people haven't read it, we can, you know, we can read it because it's short. Oh, I think that's a great idea. We can put it up for has people. Every, has everybody read this particular section? Mm -hmm. cool. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Is Miriam okay? Is she had surgery yesterday? You know, I haven't heard. Oh, okay. We need to look into that. Yeah, now. need to find oh. out. Yeah. Yeah, she got her hip done. Okay. My... Uh, word or phrase from this section is um, progressivism builds empathic policy. So uh, Aaron, do you have a word or phrase? Um, I think moral framing would be my phrase. That, I mean, it, it's kind of the theme, underlying theme throughout this section. And uh, I think it's very true that people get uh, their positions or their stances confused with their, uh, their morals and vice versa. You're gonna get to expand on that here in a minute. All right. I like the, um, the statement from Elizabeth saying that you need to, um, it does not suffice to just tell people what you will do. You need to tell them why you are going to do it. I like that a lot. That's what stood out for me the most. Greg, do you, did you have something? You're muted. Uh, I was trying to find my mouse. I couldn't find the <laughs> cursor <laughs> to get, take myself off mute. Um, I, so I could have sworn we were on 6.7 because um, the last time that we did this, I did, I outlined my values and that's what we were talking about in 6.6. In .6. So I actually moved on and read 6.7 and wrote my testimonial based on 6.7 and, and not 6.6. .6. So oh, you I, know, I, have I think I did the same thing. So, we have so, so uh, the last thing I remember talking about is um, pro-life, that, that chapter of 6.5. Y'all just got ahead, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> Fast three years. I could, I could, I could have swore we, we did 6.6 .6 last week. Well, that's but, I mean, if we, if we looked at, we recorded it last week, right? No. <laughs> yeah, we did. You want me, so you know, could, you want me check, check the it, recording I'll, to see? I'll go check it out. Hang on a second. I'll just, because I think I put it on there. Hold on a second. I'll go look. You can keep talking, Greg. Okay. Otherwise, um, if I'm, if, so I, I, I did my word or phrase for 6.7. So I'll just, I'll just share that. And yeah. um, my phrase for that is speaking your moral mind. 
Uh, you know, and uh, we did do 6.6 .6 last time. I thought so. Yeah. No. Well, that's <laughs> the section so. I read. <laughs> you, were, you did 6.6 .6 or? I did go a crumb further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did 6.6 .6 la la last week. And right, right. Oh, gosh, it's only even a page. <laughs> yeah. So why don't, so uh, we can either read it or uh, or we can, uh, why don't we read it since it sounds like people haven't read it yet. So. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's just one page. Yeah. yeah. You're moving on? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. I can, I can read for Elizabeth since I never do that. <laughs> Challenging another role this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, you know, why not? Why not? Yeah. Aaron, do you want to be George? Okay. Pardon me? I'll be George. <laughs> I'll be Elizabeth. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's get started. 6.7, the manipulated brain, framing versus propaganda. Let's be honest, framing is a way to manipulate people, to mess with their reasoning and decision-making. A modern form of propaganda by dent of cognition and neuroscience research? No, it's not. We all reason and speak in terms of frames. Whenever we communicate, we use frames no matter what the goal of our communication is. So if you're in politics and your goal is to be honest and a, an effective communicator of your political ideas and programs, then you better invest in finding the right frames. But propaganda clearly uses targeted framing as well. Of course. But propaganda is undemocratic and seeks to manipulate. And if we consider the things that we've discussed thus far, we see propaganda is so effective, it changes people's brains. Propaganda is per definition undemocratic, but that's not true for regular public discourse in Western societies, where there are multiple moral worldviews at play and good framing is needed whenever people seek to be honest about their morality and make it accessible as a template for political action. Still, the boundary between propaganda and framing seems to lie in somewhat muddy waters. Not necessarily. When conservatives talk about lowering the tax burden, all they're doing is being honest and describing their point of view. That's not propaganda or manipulation. One might not like it the way they reason about taxes, but that doesn't mean they're being undemocratic. The problem is not, this, is not that some political groups speak their moral mind, but the, that others fail to speak their moral mind. Absolutely. Mm. Okie doke. Yeah. So, All right, so as, we have a word or phrase from that section. Well, yeah, I prepared for this section, so my, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Progressivism. So <laughs> progressivism yeah it's uh, it's the uh, progressivism uh, builds empathic policy so All right so uh, hey you use that one for 6.6 .6. yeah I know I so for six point I'll tell you what I did for 6.6 .6. hang on a second I think I did Somebody can go on. I'll sit, I'll look up what I did for six point six. I well, think I did. Go uh, ahead. Uh, so I um, <laughs> I found my old um, printout from the year two thousand and one about the Green Party platform two thousand. Now, so this was the Association of State Green Parties that evolved into the Green Party. And a common ground statement with the European Federation of Green Parties, which became the European Green Party. And it's so interesting to read through all of this and there's not one value stated. It's, it's all issues. And it's, I never would have seen that before if it hadn't been for this group. I wouldn't have realized that. And, um, so from 6.6, .6, where uh, George talks about 
Am I talking too much? Yeah, anyway. No, no. <laughs> okay, anyway. So George was talking about positions that share a common moral basis stem from the same moral worldview. And um, I love that word stem, using it stem, because uh, I've had two medical go-rounds now of having stem cells injected into me, okay, to regrow cartilage. And so now um, it's, it's, it's funny how now I'm seeing values like stem cells. You put the value where you need the reparation and you get the, um, the, the, the morality, you get the, um, the good issues that you're gonna work for to grow out of that and to develop out of it. But you need these stem cells in your brain of your good values, of the, which we talk about, you know, the nutrient parent and all of that. So that's where I'm with that. You got another minute if you want. Oh, uh, that's enough. How about you, Ann? Uh, it's hard to break down a chapter when I wasn't prepared for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me pass just for now. Greg? Sure. Um, so speaking your moral mind, in order to speak your moral mind, according to Dr. Lakoff, we have, we have to use frames. In doing so, we should be activating that frame within the other person or persons. I'm not, in, I'm not interested in trying to change another person's perspective or debate a position on an issue. I'm interested in sharing my perspective and framing it in a way that is easy to understand. In framing my values, I would like to say that I value the fostering of trust and empathy in order to encourage progressive markets and develop stronger caring citizens. I would also like to foster the value of, it, of ensuring accountability in order to encourage effect, effective government of, for, and by the people. By doing so, we can move toward a better future that will create and maintain mutual responsibility between caring citizens and government. A leader's words should match their actions. Therefore, we need to be watching and listening to our leaders very carefully. When a leader's words do not match their actions, it is at this point, we need to hold them accountable, encouraging them to advocate progressive policies that are beneficial for everyone and not just a particular segment of society. As it relates to issues, I believe that healthcare is a human right, as well as food, clothing, and shelter. Why would you want to see another human being suffer because they uh, have no means to acquire health care? Why would you want to see another human being starve because they have no means to acquire food or clothing or shelter? Caring citizens would impress upon the government the importance of caring for its citizens so that those citizens that do not have sufficient means and all other citizens can contribute to the commonwealth of our society as a whole. Thank you. Wonderful. You, gotta, you had another minute if you get if you want it. Wow. No, I don't, I don't want it. <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> That's a tough one to follow. Very well prepared. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go next. Um, whoop. Hang on a second. Well, I said I would go next if I can pull it up here real quick. So progressivism builds empathic policy. In fact, empathic policy begins with the ideal nurturant family protecting and empowering family members as well as their neighbors. And today, a non-hierarchical nurturant parent family model of government is what American caring citizens want for domestic and foreign policy. Moreover, a government of by and for people was Lincoln's vision. Furthermore, a non-hierarchical nurturant parent family model of governing was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's human rights vision. 
And this moral vision of a caring society and its public government cares for all families alike, whether you're part of a wealth creator or job creator family. Caring citizens doing business in a caring economy are the solution. Progressive, progressivism builds empathic policy. Moreover, progressivism is the vaccine to conservatism's pandemic that weakens, injures, and kills Americans on a daily basis with near impunity. In fact, conservatism by its very nature is a daily insurrection to the American ideal of a more perfect union. Furthermore, conservatism governs without empathy and its ugly immoral hierarchy takes no responsibility for our union's caring tactics laid out in our constitution's preamble. And because conservatism ranks unethical job creators holier than wealth creators, ethical businessmen and women must get better at defending empathic government from autocrats. Consequently, ethical businessmen and women must demand conservatism relief and reject corporate capture of America's government. Progressivism builds empathic policy. In fact, President Biden says he knows uh, lots of partially progressive Republicans, as do I. Now is the time to make empathy for and responsibility to non-seditious Americans the moral imperative of not only the Republic and its democratic institutions, but ethical businesses as well. The USA Network of the UN Global Compact now has more than 700 business and non-business members committed to human rights and anti-corruption of government. I'm sharing a link on the uh, YouTube channel of, that lists 50 major US corporate members. You can check out that link. I think we should engage businesses that we use and demand they link their DEI statements, D diversity, equity, and inclusion to their government relations departments and demand Senate Bill 1 be passed immediately. That's, a, that's great. Great. <laughs> oh. Aaron, do you have anything to say? Well, I really wasn't prepared to reflect on all of this material and I apologize for that. But I will just say in general, as I was reading today, um, I was actually agreeing a little bit more with Elizabeth slash Greg than Aaron <laughs> slash George. <laughs> and, and the reason that I'm kind of leaning that way is if you're paying attention to what's going on right now through the lens of what we're reading, we have people say, framing things that they don't actually believe in what they're framing. And when they're finally called out on it based on fact, they say that they didn't believe what they were saying. So I'm really wrestling with that, you know, they really believe what they're saying because right now what we're seeing is once they're called out on it and they've pushed all their avenues to uh, protect what they said they believed in, they're like, ah, I didn't expect anybody to believe that anyway. Right. So I kind of wrestle with the, the position of um, George on this in that I feel like people do um, sometimes frame things with uh, not good intention and with things that they don't really totally value or believe in. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I gleaned. Again, and Chuck again. and Greg, your, your preparation is like a, a college paper. I mean, yeah. Yeah. fantastic. I think I'm portraying what I see in tweetable chunks because that's how I've been <laughs> reading for the last five years. <laughs> I agree. I feel the same way, especially when I follow up behind them. I, <laughs> it's just mind blowing. <laughs> yes. Well, but, um, I, I do see, I mean, in this, this small chapter, we did talk about propaganda. Um, the propaganda that I've seen in the last couple of years, um, I, I believe has really manipulated people um, 
to think one certain specific way that has a massive, uh, of course, depends on what side you are, but a massive negative impact on um, how we treat others in general, um, especially with the the new um, Asian discrimination and the Asian hate. You know, that's that's really all propaganda. It really is, and and uh, it's just it's a shame that our own country, um, who is full of immigrants as it is, that that we're turning on our own people and what America stands for. You know, are we gonna have to change the Statue of Liberty? Like only certain people, pe certain people are allowed in. You know, it's it's really, it's really crazy on how propaganda can completely change somebody's mind, whether it's true or not. And I think there's a lot of negative propaganda out there and, uh, we just need to fight to turn it around, go the other way. Because if we had positive propaganda, can you imagine how much, uh, how many positive things we could get done in the world? I mean, realistically, you know, and promoting empathy, you know, promoting, you know, loving the, thy neighbor and just, we just need more propaganda, propaganda for, for positivity, not negativity. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's what I have to say. Yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to I just wanted to mention something that Anna stated, which reminded me of the Statue of Liberty, which the statement is, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. What happened to that what premise? To that? Yeah. yeah, you know, what happened to that? You know, we're we don't closing mean that borders and we, pushing these people away. Yeah, we, we don't mean that anymore. So we might as well just scratch it off yeah. the, you know, the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a damn shame. <laughs> it really is. And I, I believe a lot of it's got to do with propaganda. And, and I understand, you know, that all these poor people are coming in from South America, Central America, and these people are literally fleeing for their lives. You know, that it's not like they're just thousands and thousands of people say, oh, let's all go to the States and walk there for weeks at a time and, mm -hmm. you know, and risk overheating, dying, poverty, you know, starvation, even, you know, people, they don't just want to take, you know, a couple thousand miles um, walking trip, you know, to go to another country. They're doing it. They're running from their horrible lives. And, and yeah. I, you know... And, and yes, and speaking of taking responsibility for self and others, when will this government take some responsibility for what they did to Central America back in the 80s yeah. that resulted in this? You know, people you're, don't, you're referring to Iran Contra? Well, you're referring to Iran Contra? Well, amongst other things. Yeah. Um, I, had a, uh, I have a nephew uh, and his cousin who uh, flew. Uh, over Honduras and Guatemala and Nicaragua for the CIA doing terrible things and wound up resigning his commission over that. Um, we just destroyed the governments in Central America and under the um, the catchphrase of, oh, you know, the containment of communism. Oh, that was such a big one. The mm. containment of communism. These countries will fall like dominoes. Mm. And wow, it was just all greed. Just all greed. Well, you know, last night, I don't know how appropriate this word is for this group in general, but I watched um, a new thing on Netflix. It's called crack, you know, like the drug. Crack okay. cocaine. Yep and two other things and it's that's exactly what it's about it's about um manipulation propaganda on how the united states affects so many countries not only the countries but the the people you know um this documentary states that cocaine is a celebrity drug back in the 60s 70s and then they changed it and turned it into a harder drug and how it just 
killed communities, you know, and the military was overlooking certain things and allowing for us to, I believe it, we were bringing guns to South America and we were bringing back Coke, you know? So it's just, our government did that to us. Our government, as strong as we are, just completely can devastate other countries without an actual thinking about the repercussion of that for our future. A lot and of it then, in the Reagan administry administration. So yeah, yeah. yeah. that's really when it started. And ironically, that was the president I was born under, <laughs> Reagan, yeah. uh, eighty-one. Anita, so. along those lines, it is so true that America controlled and manipulated those governments in other countries and and put them in the positions that they are, where people are just running for their lives yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> This is not good news, but I think it's gonna be harder and harder moving forward for the United States to be the judge of character because we're not even protecting ourselves right. from fascism and from, um, yeah. from propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're not even doing it ourselves. Right, yeah. You're right. So I wanna suggest that you know part of what, what we're doing here is, is um, you know, is in, in framing, we're, tr we're trying to do what Anna called good propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that's what George was, was, was saying that, you know, Elizabeth, Elizabeth saying, uh, you know, hey, it's just propaganda, you know, and, and, what, and what George is saying is, is uh, well, propaganda is undemocratic. And, and when you, when, when I learned about Alec and, um, and the Powell Manifesto, Lewis Powell Manifesto. How many of you know about the Powell Manifesto? Powell, so, yeah. so, so, so Lewis Powell, the uh, attorney for the US Chamber of Commerce uh, in 1970 was, was chosen by Nixon to be, uh, a uh, U.S. Uh, Supreme Court justice. And before he left the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, he, he wrote a, a, a letter uh, that's called the Powell Manifesto or the Powell Memo. You can, you can Google that. Uh, and, and it was a recipe. It was an outline uh, on how corporate America, the you know, conservative corporate America, not ethical corporate America, but, but corrupt conservative corporate America could capture and take over public government. Uh, and he lays, he lays out the recipe. And, and I encourage you to go and, and, and read that memo uh, because uh, you know, fast forward now to just this past week, and Jane Mayer in The New Yorker, ha, you know, has written a piece about a um, um, phone call that was recorded and, um, and then uh, leaked to her uh, between Mitch McConnell and, and um, the Koch brother that's still alive. Oh, uh, is that Charles? I forget. I think it's Charles Koch. In, in, in any case, you know, it's a, it's a confidential conversation about what words should we be using to push back? What propaganda? And this is the propaganda. You know, what words should business and their and their accomplices inside government be using? to defeat S1, to defeat H1, you know? And so that's the propaganda that, that George is talking about. George and Elizabeth are talking about. Elizabeth is raising the issue, you know, and, and George is defining it. And he's saying, you know, propaganda is done in boardrooms, you know? And, and it's done that way so that we will feel so bad about public government that we will 
that we will trash it, that we will call it inept. And, and, and of course it, it's, it's inept when corporate government corrupts it, you know? So, you know, conservatives have no problem with big government as long as it's corporate big government. Yeah. It's, it's public government that they have a problem with, you know? And, and that's the kind of framing that we can use. You know, the, you know, and when we frame those things, when we separate and distinguish what's going on with the language, and we do that over and over and over again, you know, we create the big truth. You know, we don't want the big lie repeated over and over and over again. We want the big truth over and over and over again. And the big truth is that the, our moral mission is to care for each other, mm -hmm. you know, through our government. I mean, that's what, that's what we, the people is about, <laughs> you know, we're supposed to care for each other. Right. The, du the duty to care, that's the good propaganda, but I would call it good framing. I would drop the word propaganda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, Chuck, I just looked at, took a glance at that uh, that Powell Lewis Powell memo, yeah. at, which is a blueprint to dominate democracy. Yes, and so it looks like he outlines all of these things that that should be done in order to do that. So how do how do we create a blueprint to uh, create a government for and of and for and by the people uh, to create stronger, caring citizens? How do we you know? So what what's that blueprint look like? We have to have a, a I, I I'm I believe we need to have a counter blueprint because that one has been in um, in the works for so long. It's been yes. it's been implemented for so long. Now we have to do something to counter that. Yeah. Well, you're you're asking the right questions, and and it's that it it's I've found that the ongoing conversations, you know, short conversations mm -hmm. that we have at these kinds mm -hmm. of gatherings. Mm -hmm. you know, on, a, on an ongoing basis, you know, and then we leave and we do our thing and everything that sets us thinking about the things that we need to be thinking about, yes. you know, and, and we're all in our different, you know, different avocations, vocations, occupations, you know, but there is a thread that connects us all, you know, and, and if we can continue a structured conversation, just like this one, you know, where there, and, and imagine dozens of these kinds of conversations going on. You know, right now there's only one, you know, but imagine dozens of positive conversations going on. That has real power, you know. For example, one of the people on the call between Charles Koch and, and Mitch McConnell was Grover Norquist, oh, that, you know, and, and yeah. believe me, these people on the call, Aaron, they are true believers. Oh. You know, they, they are true believers. This is, you know, uh, destroying uh, public government is, is who they are. The, you know, Grover Norquist once said, you know, we need to shrink it so small that we can drown it in a bathtub. Well, they are doing it. They, you know, they, they, are, they are doing it, you know, but he, he, when he first started uh, in, in the mid 80s, he had a weekly conversation on K Street, Wednesdays with Grover. And, you know, doing what we're doing on the conservative end. That has grown to more than 60 organizations in every state doing what we're doing on the conservative side. We don't have enough people thinking about what we need to be doing, you know, to answer Greg's question. Yeah. What was, or do we not have, oh, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, 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 you're, yeah. I was go gonna ahead. say, we'll do, what we need is our own Powell. We need a manifesto. They're, they're 50 years ahead of us. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking, you know, yes, these we, conversations. We have, a, we have our own Powell. That's what I'm saying. We've got our own power. Well, we just need to we just need to create the progressive version. 
Okay, you know, yes, that's all true. That's all true. But it, um, what is the big entertainment in this country now? It's murder. When did that happen? That's with um, O.J. Simpson, the murder trial of O.J. Simpson. Ever since then, what are you going to see on TV? Murder mysteries, um, detective, um, CSI, da, da, da. Everything is murder in this country now. How, how do we get above that horrible, the, 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 the emotional drain, the, the psychosis of it? to where we can get somebody's attention to talk about taking responsibility for self and others and empathy. And, you know, they're like, oh. I have an answer. That's nice. Tell yes. me. One person at a time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. One person at a time. That's how we do it. And, oh, and getting back to Aaron, though, we do need, yeah. a, we do need a Powell. Yeah. You know, you know, I think what you meant, let me see if this is what you meant. You know, we need somebody of that, of that stature. We need a, an overall blueprint to catch up for one that's been around for 50 years and it's make, it's advanced. It's, it's right. very advanced. I, so, so yeah. I wanted to suggest, you know, I, I'll, I'll come back to, to, to restating. I mean, th this is our blueprint, you know, uh, to restating that, but but George quite often says, Dr. Lakoff quite often says, you know, uh, we don't have the infrastructure, the progressive infrastructure. When conservatives, uh, you know, when you look at conservatives, they've got more than six or seven dozen think tanks, you know, dozens of speakers speakers bureaus, dozen, you know, uh, just when when you when you think about who, who would you go talk to about a certain issue? Almost invariably, um, as Anita said earlier, how many, we got one nonprofit for every 20 people. Oh, for 20 people, right. For every 20 right. people. And quite often it's a, it's a conservative nonprofit, mm. you know, that, that has learned the conservative moral world view. You know, uh, I, uh, anyway. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking things like Policy Matters Ohio, if, you, if you're familiar with that. I, you know? I, I, I know exactly who they are. I've so, been engage, engaging organizations like that. You know, how do we, ha, how do we get really well-meaning, smart people like that group and, and there are others in Ohio framing around morality and values first. You go to a place like Policy Matters Ohio and you get issue silo after issue silo. We've got, we're separated by all these different issues. And when they speak about an issue, there's nothing wrong with issues. Yeah. <clears throat> but when you speak about an issue, if you could frame it you know, from a from that core moral value as answering the question that we answered last week, you know, what's the moral value behind this policy? What, what is that? If, if every issue person did that, we would discover it's the politics of care. You know, it, it, is, it is a government that cares for us. It's a, it's a government made up of people, not billionaires. You know, it's empathy for one another. It's, you know, it's those values and that morality, not just the issue. Uh, you know, in the last um, year, or maybe some more in the Trump era, but um, more and more high profile people, uh, social influencers, have been talking about empathy, empathy, empathy. So I wonder where they got it. You know, what triggered that in them? Well, I mean, I th George, I th George is the, you know, he's the most quoted cognitive scientist oh. in the world. Oh, well, okay. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean he's had these, you know. That would explain a lot. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, Obama, 
was when he ran for president for the first time, used the word empathy more than a hundred times in his campaign and in that year. I mean, empathy is, remember when he, when he nominated Sotomayor? Right. And he said he wanted to, you know, he, he, he nominated her because he wanted an empathic judge, you know, and, and the conservatives jumped all over him. You know, if if only he had doubled down on that and made, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and made the debate about empathy. Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I think Obama ushered in that word. I mean, when George went and visited him in, in Illinois, uh, when he first ran for for uh, president, you know, don't think of an elephant was dog eared on every camp on every staffer's table. From a private, from a private corporation perspective, it's been this whole issue of of a, a lack of empathetic leadership. So um, I saw I saw the change after the scandals started. You know, and it started with Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, all the way to you know a, uh, AIG and some of the other ones that were recent scandals. So it's because of these scandals that I've seen the the recent uh, uptick in in people talking about empathetic leadership and leaders empowering people and leaders you know um you know being being more caring in the way that they approach uh uh managing or you know or or taking care of people you know um simon Sinek said it best he says leaders um they don't they don't care about being in charge. They care about who's in their charge. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, that's nice. Yeah. It's interesting that you that you uh, dated at that at that time. Uh, uh, we uh, fa we established the Empathy Surplus Project in two thousand nine, a year after the the. Uh, the great bank theft of America's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, money. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and um, it was uh, it was that same year that that Rock Ridge closed, uh, which was so devastating to me because I was on that advisory board, and uh, I just wrestled with, and, and I was in the financial services industry talking to clients and. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to talk about, uh, you know, banking thieves and, and uh, you know, that, and uh, it, it finally gelled, you know, uh, yeah. uh, in, in 09. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Aaron, you're right. I mean, it, they've got a 50 years head start on us. But now that we know what, what they know, and how and how they've done how the you know we have the science we know what to do, you know we just need to do it well, and do it at scale. Yeah. Yep. But it's going to take time, just like yeah. it took time yes. for them to do yes. this. It's going to take time for us to get, you know, some footing in in reference right. to the progressive with, with, perspective. Which is why this is so much different than a campaign. You know, uh, th this is not get out the vote. Yeah. Th this is, you know, this is not uh, a political party. Yeah. Th this is not that kind of stuff. Th this is, this is, you know, head work. This is thinking work. This is, you know, it's, it, it's nonpartisan. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, who are the people of empathy and compassion in both parties that we can have this conversation. Yeah, I, I just ordered a book by a man named Les Leopold called Runaway Inequality. And he says, the arc of capitalism does not bend towards justice. <laughs> really? But we must <laughs> We must bend it toward yeah. justice. Yes, exactly. yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh, what a great discussion we had today, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Very helpful. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, pull so, so what, so what I, what I will always continue to encourage is, so the next time that we, we come together, it will be on, for on chapter seven, seven. starting on, yeah, chapter seven. So what I, what I recommend and encourage is that we all come prepared for, um, you know, our statement and our testimonial, because that practice is going to get us, gain us the ability to, to deal with the things that we that we want to deal with. So, yeah. right. If, if you, if you come prepared and if you, and if you share it before you get here and say, yeah. you tell your friends, this is what we're going to discuss. Right. You know, come, come, come visit us. This is what we're going to discuss. And, uh, Anyway, yes. Uh, that next is week, very helpful. <laughs> ne next week, we we hope to have uh, George Lakoff here, and um, uh, and so uh, uh, I'm hoping it'll happen. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, uh, be prepared. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> we can always use it the next time. That's exactly That's right. right. That's exactly right. That's, That's exactly right. right. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up our closing here. I, I gotta jump off because I got another meeting to jump right into. All right, okay, great. Bye bye. All right. Okay. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. So I'm Thanks. a caring citizen. I, I, I occupy com empathy. Empathy. I, I hear highly high souls. This nation, this nation, nation under God, God shall have, have a new birth, birth of freedom. freedom. And that government, government of the of people, people, by the people, people for the people, 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 I am a person of human rights. rights. I, I care for my own safety and happiness, happiness that of, that of others. others. I am the only solution to expand life, liberty, and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And for the support of this declaration, declaration of joining caring, caring citizens, known, known and unknown, mutually pledged to each other our lives, lives our fortunes, our fortunes and our God. sacred honor. Yeah, All right. Great. Bye, Aaron. Good to see you. Bye, guys. Have a great, have a great uh, week.